Testing. Testing. Whoa. 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 Oh, shit. Oh, yeah, right. right. Wait. Wait. Demolition Man reference. And the home of the brave. Let's start the show. Sorry. Sometimes you just gotta have a little fun with audio fuck ups, and <laughs> I'm I'm known for having quite a few. Um, on Monday's show, we dealt with the heat issue, and you know, it's obvious that the UI, the current UI in the game, is not up to the task. Even Chris Roberts admits this, and you know, when you're talking about iterating on the system, and we make a lot of suggestions. And I think that his point of view is more or less that this is a dead system that is going to be completely refactored. So maybe they appreciate the suggestions, but immediate changes to the UI really not going to happen until much later when they have a better idea of everything that's going on. And then they're probably going to do an, a complete replacement of the UI that we currently have. And I understand that. So let's just say I want to keep a bit of an open mind towards this idea of quantum overheats and I kind of want to look at the pirate perspective on this issue and the possible long-term implications that this could have for pirates the heat system I think up front for pirates at least it presents a number of challenges you know Getting into position, setting up a good ambush is going to take longer. Some ships may be pushed out of viability or at least out of, you know, convenient viabilities. Things like the Buccaneer or smaller fighters. But ships like the Cutlet, ships like the Corsair, ships like the Caterpillar are obviously going to have a little bit more room to maneuver with this heat mechanic. These are bigger ships. And I think that a system like this kind of bodes well for them because these are ships that are a little bit more customizable a little bit more you know they're a little bit more open to how we can change their configuration they're bigger ships they have longer legs a little bit utilitarian maybe not the most combat worthy ships in the universe but they do have certain advantages in the fact that they're built to be kind of flexible in how players set them up more so than smaller single engine or twin engine fighters. So there's there's the potential there that these ships could become very very strong in a world like this. You know, once again, you know, I've said it a million times, the Cutlass is the gold standard. And it could very well f end up being just that thanks to a system like this depending on how far we can modify it and what we can what kind of performance we can wring out of it but you have to remember that pirates always have the initiative we initiate an action which generates a reaction which is you know the law or you know whoever coming to get us after we've done a thing now if we do that thing in a place that's very inconvenient for any responders to get to it gives us more time to complete that task and get out successfully before any reinforcements can show up. You know, having the initiative in a situation is very, very valuable because you it allows you to say this is where it's going to happen. This is when it's going to happen. This is how it's going to happen. And the longer you have before anyone can reply to what you're doing, the better off you, you know, the better off you are. Let's say your pirate org happens to have a, uh, I keep wanting to say Leviathan, I don't know why, a Kraken, right? The pirate carrier. Let's say your org has a Kraken and you can set up somewhere in the middle of a very long jump between two kind of valuable trade points. You can set up your fleet out there and you can operate off of that Kraken. So you kind of go, you move into the trade lane, 
you set up whatever the interdiction mechanic is going to end up being you set that up you interdict a freighter as soon as you've got it stopped and locked down you of course shut the interdiction off because you don't want anybody else accidentally dropping into your little battle scene you go you raid the freighter you take the goods you bring them back to the kraken you offload them onto the kraken and the kraken becomes kind of like your little base of operations in the middle of a trade lane Eventually, people will get wise to what you're doing, so you may want to keep your Kraken moving between this location and that location to not be predictable. But once again, you have the initiative, so you kind of get a good feel for when it's a good time to move, when it's a good time to stay, and you're always kind of moving around, so it's very difficult to find you and hunt you down. And this kind of a mechanic, it prevents... It doesn't, well, it doesn't prevent, but it makes it more inconvenient for fighters to get at you. It makes it more inconvenient for support ships to kind of get at you. So even though it may be somewhat of an inconvenience up front, I think long term, the benefits of a system like this are quite strong. Now, of course, does this mean that it's going to be a free ride for pirates and that this is the end of the world and, you know, they're, we're just going to ruin the game? No, it doesn't. Players who trade, players who fly trade vessels are quickly going to figure out that, you know what, sticking to the standard geometry of trade routes not the healthiest way to kind of go about things, especially, you know, and the inconvenience of having to get together and maybe a fleet to prevent interdiction or to at least have a response if there are pirates there. It, you know, they may just say, you know what, I can fly a little bit this way, I can fly a little bit that way, and I can change the angle of approach between two worlds. I can change the angle that I'm flying and thereby bypass any potential interdiction. Players are going to wake up to that pretty damn quickly. And they're going to say, you know what? It's not really all that convenient for me to always be flying around looking for, you know, looking for help or looking for a convoy to jump into. If I just fly a little bit over to the, towards this moon, if I quantum a little bit over to this world and then change my angle of approach to the world that I'm actually trying to get to, I won't, I won't be interdicted by players. So I don't have to worry about that. Whereas NPCs are probably going to be sticking to those established trade routes. So overall, is this going to be like something that's going to, you know, ruin the game for regular trading players? No, I don't think it is. I think that overall, it's going to be something that you know, it's going to be something that they're going to adapt to. Something that they're going to go, well, it's kind of dumb to just fly around in straight lines on predictable paths, whereas NPCs are going to keep doing it. So chances are pirates are going to end up raiding a lot of NPC ships, whereas player ships are going to be a little bit smarter and a little bit harder to catch. And chances are the best places to catch players might be, you know, near a moon or near a, a docking station where they plan to drop off their goods. And that is probably going to be a lot riskier. You may notice that when you travel a long distance between worlds, you kind of move out of comm satellite range. And therefore, your actions may not entirely be recorded. So pirates may say, you know what, for sheer convenience, it may be better to do everything in deep space and to avoid the areas around planets and moons, areas where activities can be noticed and uh, responded to. Chances are this could, you know, this is basically something that kind of works to the benefit of pirates. Yeah, it's an inconvenience up front, but long term, it could yield a lot healthier results, especially if you're out there and you're operating off of something like a Kraken then you you could be in a situation where you're just filling that Kraken up with all kinds of NPC loot and then you're shipping it off through a third party, an innocent and completely law-abiding third party to a local base where, you know, they're not too worried about, you know, the origin of the goods or their state, you know. They might just say, oh, well, you know, we'll take this off your hands for a reasonable price. And so that may end up becoming the reality. It's something that, yeah, I think it does look like something that's going to suck right off the bat. But 
if CIG plays the system correctly and they make it a system that rewards, you know, that isn't just a flat out penalty to everyone, but something that rewards depth of knowledge in the game and, you know, knowledge of components and systems and how to operate them efficiently. And it ends up, you know, being something that is rewarding to learn and something that's rewarding to kind of not only personally rewarding to play but something that's also rewarding financially i think that long term if they play it right a lot of players might go along with it and say you know what okay you know what i can work with this this is something that actually has some value to me so it may not all be negative i'm sure that certainly in the current iteration of the game, I still believe that it's it was a bad idea to introduce it now in the current state of the game. But I think long term, if it's work, you know, if they work it correctly, it could actually be a boom for pirates. And it's something that definitely should be watched. It makes things like the Kraken seem a lot more attractive. But you know, once again, we'll have to wait and see how things take shape in the future. But this is kind of where I, I see things going. This is my opinion. This is my point of view on the topic. Anyways, that's the show for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And thanks for watching. Thank you for watching. So, so, so if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest in the Star Citizen and Squadron 42's development, please follow, please follow, please follow us on our social media channels. See you soon.